Welcome back to Potter's Pockets, episode 18, chapters 11 through 13 in Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, the third volume in the series, The Firebolt, The Patronus, and Gryffindor versus Ravenclaw. And back with me, I have my two esteemed colleagues, Miss Sarah Miller and Mr. Wes Chance. Welcome back, you two. Thank you. Happy birthday, Alex. Thank you. Happy birthday, Alex. Thank you. It's great to be doing this on my birthday. I feel very much like Harry in this moment, having the birthday moment with the friends. And, you know, it's interesting. It makes me think a little bit about birthdays. And I was, I was wondering what y'all might think about this, that um, what seems to make a good birthday is not the things you do on your birthday, but the fact that you see it as a good birthday, right? Like a, a good birthday for Harry is he's not rich and he doesn't get a ton of things, but he hears from his friends. They show him love and they give him a couple of cool things. And um, that seems to be enough for it to be, you know, an archetypally good birthday. And it's funny because I think when I was young, I, I had some Draco Malfoy in me and I thought, or, or some Dudley in me thinking that some golden goose would be that which makes the uh, birthday perfect. But the goal is not to make the birthday perfect, but to, uh, you know, make it good and to enjoy it. And it's been a really good birthday. So I'm really happy to have this as its capstone. <laughs> yeah, well, how many presents yeah. did you get? I mean, did you keep a tally or what? Yeah, you know, I got, um, so I taught today and the students were very kind to me. And I got um, a few pieces of candy, like substantial ones, like a Ghirardelli box of chocolates. Oh, yeah. Students' family. That's very nice. nice. And um, Caitlin made some German chocolate uh, cake bites for me last night. And German chocolate is my favorite chocolate. And it tasted so good that, like I was saying to y'all beforehand, I didn't have to pretend that I liked it. I liked it so much. <laughs> like I've had to do with so many things in the past, not with her, but just, you know, in the course of living. And that it, I just, it's incredible how often right now I get to say that I just really genuinely enjoy what's happening around me. And that's great. Wow. Um, but yeah, how many presents? It was around three or four, but I have a big one this weekend. We're going on a little trip, and so that'll be cool. Um, <laughs> Excellent. No yeah. firebolt, though, huh? Okay, yeah. So the first thing that popped out about this to me that I'd like to put to y'all is this. How about that decision by Hermione? Whoa. And uh, that does seem to prefigure sort of her character for the future, but also to... Um, to bring us back to, you know, part of her character from the past, too. Um, she seems very McGonagall-like to me there. And Well, what do y'all think about that decision she makes to go behind the boys' back for their own good? It struck me that she's ashamed, or maybe that's not quite the right word, but she's blushing anyway, right? Fiercely behind her book, which is upside down. So <laughs> she, she's conflicted <laughs> about it in some kind of way. And I, I think it'd be interesting to try to tease out what she might be feeling because she does seem like she thinks it was the right thing to do, but she also, you know, feels their, their anger towards her. So it's rough. Yeah, and they find themselves at odds with her again, like the time before the troll. And so that time, a sort of superordinate goal brought them back together. And then she had a chance to show good faith with them. And so it'll be sort of interesting to see how they re remake connections and also add to that the fact that now scavers is missing and ron believes that um and i think that actually happened later so i'm sorry to bring that up exactly now but later on this will be compounded by the fact that scavers's rat disappears with crookshanks as the number one suspect and so i, I also wanted to sort of mm. examine that connection because it looks as if the relationship between crookshanks and scavers in some way parallels the relationship between Hermione and Ron, and I'd sort of like to understand what's going on there. And maybe even parallel that to, what's with uh, Harry noticing this other seeker on Ravenclaw? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, I guess what we find out in the end is sort of like, can maybe give us some shape to that, that like, uh, that Crookshanks was right, say, to suspect that Scabbers was like, a nefarious creature right um and um i think hermione is right to to, to suspect the sender of the of the broom right like she's actually out, right isn't she that she's right yeah no she's not right about the, the source of evil right but right. 
um, they don't like that she's inconvenienced them. But I feel like her reddening and then, like, she gets up in Ron's face defiantly. It's not like uh, before where she runs away from them. I, I, I don't know. Like, I think we've been talking about Hermione as sort of, like, a little bit beyond what, I mean, she's obviously beyond them in skill, beyond all of her peers. Yes. She's beyond them in terms yeah. of the complexity of her schedule. Um, and the time management. <laughs> I, yeah. And, and, and like, and I would, I would argue maybe her like understanding of magic in general seems to be at like just an inherently deeper level. But um, I guess when she does that, I wonder if that doesn't sort of um, get at the downside of being beyond other people, which is that, with great power comes great responsibility with great understanding become comes great responsibility and i think it's easy to abdicate that responsibility but um when when you are you know the smartest person in the room you can't or it, um, i guess you can conceivably uh just hold yourself off from a community and pretend like their welfare doesn't matter to you but but i don't know i feel like she's at this point where she has to exercise the well-developed understanding that she has that like her knowledge is not useful unless it's put into action um and and it, it might be uncomfortable for her it certainly alienates other people but um i'm i thought i was like kind of proud that she did that because this is a person who knows what it's like to not have any friends well that's um, yeah yeah that's I think there's, yeah, two points just to add to that that I think are great. That just makes me think of the parallel to what Neville attempted to do with the group in the first book, stand up to his friends, which is what Hermione does there because of what she thinks is right. And I think I agree with you that um, what what she seems to be experiencing is uh, the, the problem of the relative immaturity of her friends and their undeveloped moral sense. Because what she can do is clearly puzzle the situation together and realize that the most likely candidate to have sent it is Sirius Black. And if there's any chance that it was Sirius Black, and he is the murderer everybody believes him to be, then the logical thing to do is to get that firebolt stripped down. However, Harry and Ron, as fairly unsophisticated reasoners at this point, at this point, just see the fact that there is a firebolt in front of them, don't care where it came from, and just want to play with it. They see it just as a source of fun and action and victory. So they have motivated, they, they have different motivations behind their reasoning and less sophisticated reasoning. So I completely agree with you that <laughs> it is Hermione's job to lead them forward with her thinking and that uh, she is doing the right thing to try and help her friend because, uh, even though it turns out that Harry would not have been making a mistake, that would not not be due to his own wisdom or sharp. Or yeah, I sort of um, this sort of always reminds me not always, but this reminds me of this question that I first heard articulated really nicely in The West Wing, um, as is the case with so many things. Aaron Sorkin says it better than very very many people have ever tried to say it, but. Um, the idea of um, what is someone who is uh, in a position of leadership, what is their obligation, particularly in a democracy or a democratic republic, so or a republican democracy, I guess. Um, uh, if you are elected to represent someone, is it your job to represent what's best for them, even if it's not popular with, say, your constituents? Or is it your job to do whatever your constituents or the majority of them want, right? So somebody like Abraham Lincoln might answer that question and say, actually, I'm gonna do what's best for the whole, even though it's extremely unpopular, but it's because I'm in a position of leadership and I've like, you know, developed my moral compass and my intellect far enough to, to be able to make that decision. Like I, the development of prudence and wisdom, we, we want to elect people who are going to be our representatives, but sometimes what we want is not necessarily somebody who is going to make good decisions on our behalf, but somebody who's going to like represent our voice and interests and opinions. And like, 
with the elections right around the corner, I think that's a really interesting question. Like, what exactly do people want when they vote for somebody to be their leader? And when you're as capable as Hermione, naturally leadership would be where you find yourself. And that, like, she's put in this position where she has to do the thing that's unpopular, but also the thing that's best. And uh, that requires a certain amount of courage I suppose and she's going to do it later too with um what's his name Bucky um that like uh just because you decide that something is a failing endeavor or it's not popular like a truly well-formed person is going to do the good as opposed even if it doesn't win them friends I suppose um I don't know I, that's something I always think about. I know it's sort of a tangent, but you just made me think about that. It happens to be germane at the moment. Hmm. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I'm not familiar with the show, but I mean, it is a really interesting question. Um, and I think it can be referred to the, uh, the sort of like Republic microcosm thing where like every person has those, those hierarchies of drives and reason and, and everything within them. And it's like, how mm -hmm. do you best, you know, manage them? There's, that's sort of like one of the main philosophical questions you could ask, right? Like, uh, and in, in Hermione's case, yeah, clearly her reason is like mastering things. And clearly in the boy's <laughs> case, in the boy's case, their desires are mastering because they, they, even their imagination goes to all these people who would, who would want to show love to Harry, right? They, they can't really like conceive of it being somebody trying to hurt them because the thing is so cool and they, they're so interested in it. And it's like for Hermione to, I mean, maybe like the greatest sacrilege of all is for her to like imagine that such an awesome broom could have come from someone who wanted to harm them. Like it just taints the broom in some way, you know? Um, and the, the combination of that with the, with the scene with Crookshanks and the, um, and Scabbers and the sneakoscope popping out and starting to go crazy, right? I think there is definitely some kind of, um, li little parallel going on there of, uh, of something to do with, you know, Ron's undeveloped consciousness and Hermione's like fast and furious one. Um, and then Harry's, you know, got that that sneakoscope pops out again it's like we haven't heard about that thing for a long time it's just been forgotten um but it's mm -hmm. just it's like this little in inkling popping up that like something is off here and we're not sure what it is and oh well let's just ignore it and put it back in the socks you know oh very interesting that something's sort of growing underneath the surface and we can't quite identify it yet we're still in the anxiety phase of the mystery where or where in the horror movie when the thing that we have to face has not yet revealed itself but is being indicated by odd things happening that we sort of refuse to recognize at that moment um, and we're misattributing the causes. Oh, uh, just to throw out two other questions I was sort of interested in thinking about uh, at some point today just because I don't want to forget them are these. I'd like to, at some point, consider Harry's relationship to his Quidditch team. At some point, he's playing five days a week with them. So it seems as if, mm. and you know, they play a death-defying game. So even though you don't, we don't get a lot of interpersonal interaction between all of them, like we hear about the girls kissing them after the Ravenclaw game, and Fred, like, ri almost ripping his head off, he likes them so much. It's like he spends several hours a day with them. And I wonder if it's just supposed to be understood how close their bond is, or I mean, be or, you know, what their bond is compared to, say, like, Hermione and Ron, or whether a bond of sportsmanship is a special bond that requires less speech, or something like that. And then I wanted to ask a really cruel question, which is, don't you think Snape got exactly what he wanted when you think about what happened to the men who tortured him? Lupin, the werewolf, beggar, Pettigrew, dead or traitor, both good for Snape, Sirius Black, uh, uh, traitor slash uh, in Azkaban, and then James dead. It's like, man, if they bullied him, you can imagine the imagination that Snape would have had growing up. And it's like, man, 
yeah, from that angle, it really looks fairly dark, but it's like, well, Snape, why are you getting so mad at Harry? It's like, look at what happened to the people that used to torture you. You, you, you got your just desserts. Yeah, but I think when you're, I mean, when you're bullied, yeah, you, what sounds like justice to you is actually vengeance. He probably wanted to bully them back, um, which isn't the same as seeing the people who hurt you suffer at the hands of someone else. Right. You yeah. know? He also, you know, Snape is in a position where he's so close to the, the ideal that he can taste it, right? He's, he's not defense against the dark arts teacher quite yet. He's still potions, you know, and he's, mm -hmm. uh, he's got, you know, all his friends or, or sorry, all of his enemies friends have um, tasted his wrath, you know, uh, metaphorically, except now the sun is back. And so it's like this, this fly in the ointment. So when, when that happens, mm -hmm. I feel like, you know, he, he, his rate, his anger and his, um, malevolence are, are so powerful in this book. Uh, it, it only seems to grow, right. The more that, um, he can't quite get what he really wants. So do you think that that's sort of the, um, the totalitarian or sort of ice queen slash queen maleficent aspect of Snape as opposed to the heroic aspect that he like Lucifer has everything, but it's that one little thing that he doesn't have that, like you said, fly in the ointment that, that drives him up the wall. Whereas the sort of heroic path is to take whatever little you have like Harry Potter and then to make something special out of it, like stone soup or to make the stone of little worth the arch stone because that which you focus on is that which has the greatest worth. Um, and so that's interesting. So he's like kind of like a spoiled rich kid who's gotten everything that he wanted, but in not getting everything that he wants, sort of like Dudley, he, uh, mm. he, he becomes utterly malevolent and, and totally inversely irrational about it. So he's got such an undeveloped sort of aggressive, nasty, resentful dark side that he just, he, he loses control. He's so unsophisticated with it that he loses it, control of it on the child consistently. Hmm. It, it kind of looks that way. It's, I would be curious to see what kind of counsel Dumbledore is giving him behind the scenes, you yes. know, like to try to get him right with everything. Um, Cause that would be, you know, a, a, a colossal challenge. Um, and a, and a great, well, I don't know. Like we hear a lot from uh, McGonagall to go to your other question yes. about Quidditch. We hear quite often from her that she talks to Snape, you know, outside yes. of class time and they, and they like make like, you know, jabs at each other about Quidditch. And that's like, that seems pretty healthy actually. Yes. Um, as, as seriously as they both take it, you know, at least that's something to like have an outlet about. So. Right. They're both so equally connected to the community and love of the community that they, they feel actual competitive rivalry at an intra-community game, indicating a similarity of spirit, even though they come from differing perspectives. And it is interesting because we will later find that Snape is taken into Dumbledore's confidence in a way, in a sun-like way, that no one else is, which is incredible. And Snape will show a willingness to uh, make the ultimate sacrifice for the Lord, you might say. All right. Okay, and so one, one other question that I think I didn't ask, but which I sort of wanted to address as a sportsman is this. The book doesn't seem to make a very big deal about how unsporting it might potentially be for Harry Potter to receive the firebolt. If anything, this is like the hero get, being given the super ray gun and standing among the common herd like, to a tremendous degree because uh, now, now he has pulled essentially, but not with the same intention, uh, the same move the Slytherin pulled. And now he has a way overpowered piece of equipment, way stronger than and faster than what everybody else has. In fact, Ravenclaw, they've got the old clean sweeps. And I hope you guys noticed that um, that um, uh, Madam Hooch used to wear, used to ride a silver arrow. So she's a figure of Artemis of the silver arrows, um, and which I cool. suspected about her and sort of chased. And she's represented as having very short, spiky hair in the movies. And so I think they nailed the idea of a chaste woman who will take no man ever, which is the idea behind Artemis. Um, she, like Athena, remains virginal. Um, uh, and so there you go. 
very interesting. But I guess funny also that then she would be a, a Quidditch player, given sort of the symbolism of the broom. And perhaps um, that's interesting. Now I understand what the broom means in context of a witch, somebody who develops her own free-spirited intellect. So I guess we do have to burn them. All right, but what about that? He gets this great piece of equipment, and it, nobody ever says that's unfair. And I thought that was interesting. Um, it's just considered, wow, good luck. Yeah, kind of. It's Again, it's like how seriously people take this sport. It's like anything seems to go. Yeah. Um, they'll, they'll descend to all kinds of tricks and um, uh, hijinks to try to, right? Like, Malfoy and his cronies dress up like mentors. Um, and uh, down, no good trick. And and um, Penelope Clearwater and Percy have a bet on, you know, which could like drive their budding romance apart if it goes wrong. So it's like people take it really serious. And Firebolt is like, you know, something that seems again, yeah, so out of the ordinary that no one can really. Um, you know, fault him for, for going ahead and using it. Yeah. Well, okay. How about the Patronus then? Uh, would you guys like to just quickly read the description, the initial description of a Patronus? I, I have it here on 237. And I'd kind of like to pick that apart a little bit. Would that be okay? Uh, yeah. Sure. All right. Hey, can you Do tell me... Before you read it, uh -huh. can you tell me what the general area is? Because I've got my British book. Um, it's not 237. Sorry. It is, the, the paragraph starts with Harry had a sudden vision of himself. And there's a large space. Got it. Got okay, it. perfect. Harry had a vision of himself crouching behind a Hagrid-sized figure holding a large club. So using his imagination to bridge the gap between known and unknown territory. So let's see what it actually is. Professor Lupin continued, the Patronus is a kind of positive force, a projection of the very things that the Dementor feeds upon, hope, happiness, the desire to survive. But it cannot feel despair as real humans can so the Dementors can't hurt it. All right, and then we hear that it's very advanced. And I just thought it was interesting that he says kind of twice there, right? Um, it's kind of a positive force. And, oh, no, where does he say it again? Uh, uh, uh. Excuse me, he must say it a little bit later. I, he says it frequently here. Oh, sorry, it must not be in that quote, but in any case. Before that, I think, just before oh, just that. Oh yeah, which is a kind of anti-dementor, right. Right, 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 thank you, Wes. I was gonna think I was making things up, but yes, which is a kind of anti-dementor, a guardian that acts as a shield between you and the dementor, and that's a helpful part of the description too. So, good, good, good. And I like that it's beyond ordinary wizarding level, which means it's an exceptional piece of magic. Um, which is interesting because I, I think that opens up the question of uh, what, Harry and Hermione's relationship to magic is. Obviously, they're both very talented, but in different ways. Um, uh, but okay, the Patronus, what do y'all think of that? My, my, in, my inclination is to go to the, the root of the word first, right? Like patron, lord, father. Isn't, aren't those words all sort of connected there and, yes. and alluded to? Um, so it's interesting that Harry first imagines it as a Hagrid, um, kind of, <laughs> uh, like that's his, his immediate, like, thought of something that would be an anti-dementor, and it's not far off, right, because it is going to be someone close to him, um, larger than life, and powerful, and, and good in his eyes, right? And he did deliver him from evil on, as a baby, like a father. And then Bran yeah. brought him into the world of Hogwarts like a father as well. Or like a mother. I mean, to deliver someone to a new world that is, that seems quite motherly. I, I think of um, the, uh, yeah, the root, I guess I was, 
Wes, as you were saying that, I was literally Googling it. Um, I have it written down in my book from when I taught it, but I, I didn't I didn't totally trust that particular notation. But um, it's I think it literally means I expect protection um, or I wait for a, like a patron in the sense of someone like a patron saint um, or the way that a lord, father, country um, are the source of protection for um, an individual. That's sort of how I think of it. Um, yeah, and I think it is an ultimate Christian symbol, which I think yeah. there's a lot of poor superficial interpretations of this text wrong because the ultimate protection or father figure is the magic that comes from within, which is harnessed by an incantation tradition and the magic of the current individual, like a living God tethered to a cross. It's the Logos, the ultimate protection one has. And this is what Harry ultimately has realized that when he thinks he sees his father is that he is himself his father and that he is the author of his best protection through harnessing the magic within himself. And thus, the greatest protection one can have is the development of the problem-solving capacity one has in the world, which is uh, the use of the mind, or the logos, as I often call it. Um, and thus, Harry can expel his own demon. Um, yeah, when, I, yeah. when, I taught this, when I taught this book, um, it was in the context of like a, a philosophy and theology course as well um, or sort of interdisciplinary in that sense and I think I don't think that they're mutually exclusive I'm not sure if that's what you were suggesting Alex but that this idea that oh I, I use like the theology of the incarnation right like the first chapter of John is in the beginning with the word and the word was with God and the word was God and then the word became flesh and dwelt among us and like um the that that Harry thinks he sees his father, but really discovers it is himself harnessing something from within. It's, it's like harnessing the part of yourself that you attach or, or feel attached to someone else. It's like the, 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 I mean, the soul or the, the, the spirit, I guess, the, in, the, in the Christian sense. I think that that, maybe not spirit might be the wrong word, um, but I think it can be both like Christian and not necessarily Christian at the same time. Oh, Which absolutely. I think is quite frankly, I think that that is one of the geniuses of the book is that it, it has so much theology in it, but it need not, it needs, it doesn't require it the way sometimes it feels like, uh, sometimes it feels like Narnia requires it more i don't know well, i think it shares a similar symbolic structure if not the same um conscious theologies I, I i don't think it has a conscious theology but i think that just the structure of the narrative uh seems to suggest or seems to make the same points as that parallel um narrative or mythological narrative the christian and so yeah. they share a common sort of thrust or or, or purpose, um, seeking like the greatest thing that to protect you in this world is the development yeah. of the logos. Um, and that, that the kinship of those with the logos is the greatest relationship possible. And I would say that's actually what has led to the development of giant religions and nation states, where what is the connection between you and the other people? Yeah. Not blood, but something even more profound. Um, yeah. Whether you know it or not. <laughs> Or like the, I mean, from the Christian sense, if it is the the most, the greatest protection you can find is the development, is in the development of the Logos. If you think of the, the word as incarnate in the world, then the, the most, the greatest thing you can do to protect yourself is to like cultivate the Christ-like qualities that we all have the capacity to cultivate, but often choose not to. Um, yeah, and so far, what you mean there is cultivating the Logos, I completely go agree. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm interested in the way that the scene develops to, um, to follow this kind of line of thought a little bit, like something whooshed suddenly out of the end of his wand. It looked like a wisp of silvery gas 
did you see that? Said Harry excitedly. Something happened. <laughs> Very good, said Lupin. And so it's like he needs that kind of um, confirmation from Lupin. Like, did you see that? Right? It's, it's a real thing. It's not simply um, a hallucination, uh, a, a subjective thing. It's actually there. And so he gets that confirmation right away, right? And then they try it right out. Um, but in this next paragraph, I think is super important for that uh, that thematic uh, or theological line of thinking. So Harry said, yes, gripping his wand very tightly, blah, blah, blah. Any second now he might hear his mother again, but he shouldn't think that, or he would hear her again. And he didn't want to, or did he? Mm. So that right there, the the suspicion that deep down you want the bad thing right because because it belongs to you because you love it in some way and because it's being taken from you and that's true you know all of that stuff that's very that's very genesis 3 to me that's the fall right it's like you do the thing mm. that is wrong and then you see that the person you love did the bad thing and so you do the bad thing too right that that's like that's if not a christian or judeo christian or whatever Thing. It's at least something that's expressed very powerfully in the Christian, Judeo-Christian stories. So right. Seems right. like it's there. And it also seems to suggest that the best way to deal with trauma in your own life is the development of your own mental capacities, your own logos, mm -hmm. and through also developing a more balanced view of the world rather than just seeing that which causes despair and hopelessness and horror, also focusing on the best moments in your life. And in fact, trying to iterate those sorts of moments and then harnessing that power to develop um, a defined sense of self to bolster yourself against the darkness. And the question I wanted to ask is, because I never thought of this before until I started doing this with all of you, um, was to what extent do you think the Patronus is an abstract representation of one's animagus self? Because I never made the connection that obviously the uh, those who become animaguses, they become the animal that is also the patronus, um, mm -hmm. because uh, prongs. That's uh, that's that means that uh, what James Harry's father became is the same. Or actually, actually, perhaps even more interestingly, I don't know that it is the case that James's patronus was a stag. I think it was. I think they do say that it was. But is it the case that the animagus that what your father would be? would become your patronus ah and I'm, I'm not sure what i'm where i'm going with there but i i thought there was a connection that potentially what your patronus would take shape as in an abstract form or sort of magical light against darkness form was in some way an abstraction of what you become when you devolve into an unconscious version of that as an animagus or or a less conscious an animal form yourself that you then harness your animal form and use it against the darkness. I don't know if that makes any sense. I know it's very general at this point. Um, well, um, Lupin does say does say that every Patronus is unique to the wizard who conjures it. Okay. But but I wonder if um, going back to something we were talking about earlier about how Hermione's moral compass is so much further developed um, and as, as is her intellectual capacity and Ron is like hobbling behind them very <laughs> um, and also like easily driven into rage and um, maybe Irritable. envy at times and like Harry seems to be kind of positioned within the, with, between the two of them right like he literally is um, socially between the two of them when they are in their fight um, and uh, if just to, I mean, to think about like that as he, you know, sort of being drawn to two different impulses that his friends might represent. Um, thinking about that in terms of like, you know, the animal, right? Um, that like, if his dad is Mooney, no, his, his dad is pronged, right? Mm -hmm. And his Patronus ends up taking the shape of the father that or the the animal that his father turned into we know that like maybe his dad was also kind of more like ron um uh maybe not the world's best student actually it's probably more like fred and fred and george yeah right? that's what they're uh, yeah 
I, I think what's interesting too is like the the memories that he tries to me are really interesting, like and the degree to which they work. And if it is like you said to us, like there's a, like a kind of a microcosmic Judeo Christian narrative inside this chapter. Um like there's the moments where we learn what the Patronus is and it's sort of this protective force an incarnation of sorts and then there's the fall where he wants to hear the bad things but the first thing he thinks about is flying what it's like to to fly so to separate yourself from everyone to be free of constraints a totally selfish experience um then the second one is just him and gryffindor winning the house championship and the third one is what it felt like to um like find a home somewhere like figure out who he was and where he belonged kind of without regard to any division um i think that that that's interesting to me um that that was the one that worked much more than the others um yeah that, there and see what see if you have an, a sense of why um i like the way that he never or or Lupin never asks Harry what his happy memory is, right? He just tells him, think of a really happy memory. Think of a happier memory. Think of the happiest happy memory, dude, like happier. And so he never gets him to like articulate it because I guess that would somehow maybe use the energy that he needs to cast the spell properly or something. But yeah, it's interesting that progression that you're talking about is cool. Yeah, and that's something that I I remember when the movies were first coming out, I thought that was something that this movie majorly lacked and that was a really important part of the book, the relationship that develops. Again, one of these outside the initial friend group relationships, right? We had Hagrid and we had the initial group at first, the first couple books. But now we also have the Quidditch team developing more and more. And we have also this relationship with Luke and this personal relationship developing, sort of the opposite of what Gilderoy Lockhart was attempting with harry um and so it, it, it's like lupin like you said wes is doing things like encouraging harry and saying, yeah yeah no you is good and then you know also gauging this expectation saying this is very hard so i don't want you to get very disappointed and also sort of teaching harry about what's meaningful in a conversation right the moments that we get about him which i was telling y'all in the pre-show made me laugh like <laughs> Lupin looked paler than usual after the mention of Voldemort's name or when, when Sirius Black gets mentioned do, you must have known him he turns his head very quickly there's something anomalous about his behavior something that hips Harry to uh, he struck a nerve and that that's part of the importance of personal interactions with um, a person um, as, as you're developing and also part of the the importance of personal interactions as a teacher with a student and also understanding that they go from not being able to do something at all and having no idea to learning sort of the rote way to do something then to showing some promise with it. I'm thinking about writing here. Um, then to give it some form and then finally to give it uh, an excellent individual and yet historically rooted articulated form. Um, and uh, you know, maybe that's the most important thing that a student can learn while they're in education. Hey, y'all. Can we start this again? Mm -hmm. Okay, doing that now. All right, and we're back. Okay, so I think it's, it's interesting how Harry um, sort of lets his guard down also around Lupin. Because mm. one, one thing that I found pretty funny was when Lupin brings out his like his special treat after all the chocolate and stuff he's got the butter beers and he's like you won't have tried this before harry just blurts out yeah i like that stuff <laughs> yeah so it's like oops so harry is i mean i guess understandably a little worn out from all his lessons and stuff but still like that's that's about the worst slip that he's had maybe in the whole series as far as like being a sly troublemaker type of wise guy you know he's like really dropping the ball there so like, um, are you are you seeing that Lupin is like naturally his friend? Like he feels that buddy buddy connection, sort it, of the same way his father might have. It is, and it's because I think it's like justifiable because it's because they're talking about some super 
deep and dark stuff, right? So they, that's right before they get into the Dementor's Kiss, which I definitely wanted to talk about. Um, kind of going back to your question about what what is the Patronus? What does it have to do with your soul or your your spirit animal or something? This whole section reminds me strongly of the Golden Compass books, mm -hmm. you know, with the demon uh, familiars. I was going to ask um, you about that. It's like, you know, it's something like a, a guardian angel or a witch's, you know, familiar spirit. Um, but in those books, it's not connected with uh, evil per se or demonic forces in the way that we might uh, assume based on the name. Uh, instead, it's it's something that every person has. It's totally normal to have one. It represents parts of your nature, which in um, in Lyra's world are visible, but in our world, right, are not. Uh, and so it's it's like the coolest coolest idea I think um, any writer of fantasy has had since Tolkien. But that's just me. Okay, but so the the Dementor's kiss, right, is like it's the way that the 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 most extreme scary thing that we've seen the dementor is taken to its logical conclusion right that it's it actually annihilates your soul but without killing you and that that's somehow like worse than death um the way that lupin goes ahead and tells him that with a slightly twisted smile i thought that was so like um indicative of how much he's trusting harry and trying to be that that close um confidant to him well that's fascinating because just oh, something so interesting about that is that a um what brings them together and what seems to bring people closest together is sharing that which is most difficult that they deal with and that that is what true diversity is because then you sort of forgive somebody everything else about their life because you have the deepest possible sort of brotherly connection I think this is the sort of thing that people talk about who come back from war with other individuals. And so something about the kiss and how it's presented by Lupin with that smile, it's like he's apologizing for how the world is. And uh, A, he's teaching him something absolutely terrible about the world. The very worst thing that could possibly exist exists in Harry's world. It sucks your soul out. It's like Shang Tsung from Mortal Kombat. It's the scariest thing ever. I've told you that that's one of my great motivating factors for differentiating in this world not wanting to have my soul sucked out <laughs> um which is interesting but um what what that doesn't do to harry is utterly traumatize him though what it does do <laughs> is something sarah mentioned to us in the first book series which is give us one of the great lines from the narrator which is upon uh harry hearing about the dementors kiss his reaction i thought was per perfect harry accidentally spat out a bit of butterbeer <laughs> So, you know, he just, he spits up. He's like, what the heck did you just say to me? That's incredible. But I think that's what real education is about and how you build the, the strongest possible bonds with your students by sharing with them that which is darkest and scariest in the world and helping them develop the defensive capacity to deal with that by means of the logos. And that that's sort of what we see developing here as Lupin helps uh, uh, Harry to define himself and define his logo so that he can fight the unknown in the world and the trauma in his own past. They're also becoming much closer to friends, uh, sort of like how Dante becomes much closer to a peer to Virgil during the course of the the um, the Inferno and the Purgatorio, and then ultimately has to be his peer by going on by himself and being a master himself. And I wonder if this is supposed to model what the good relationship between the teacher and student is unlike sort of the relationship with Snape. The, uh, the context of it is, is also interesting. It's that Harry um, finding out that this is the punishment for black, right? For Sirius black at this point, now that he's eluded them for so long, the, uh, Ministry has given the Dementors permission to perform the the kiss um, on him if they catch him, and so it's it's his own turn to be pretty twisted here, right? He says that he deserves it, and Lupin, you know, questions him on that. Um, but again, it's it's interesting that he 
he does so in a way that's as if they're equals, right? He asks him, like, why do you think that? It's it's a great, I think that is a good teacherly sort of thing to do there, right? To, instead of saying, I disagree, saying, why do you think that, right? Do you really think so? Yeah, and that is, that is interesting to what extent, to what extent then, and I think this is the point made over and over again in this text, especially with the fact that Harry thinks he sees his father and the father is his ideal. And you think of the words in the New Testament of Jesus, it's not me, but, or I come in the name of the father and, or it's not because of me, but the father that I have glory. And that um, sort of the idea of teaching is that it's the present teaching the future present or the present guiding the future. And so you treat the students with respect because you hope them to treat children and students when they are the adults and it is their time with respect uh, as well. And in that way, you guide the production of a new and better future um, by means of cultivating you know, their minds in the best possible way so that they can make the best possible choices for themselves. Um, but okay, okay, yeah, and not to mentor's kiss, I would like to talk a little bit about what it means to have your soul sucked out. Does that mean a state of utter hopelessness? And there's a correlate in Dante, in um, Antonora, the second subcircle of circle nine. Um, if you commit a, a betrayal of state, like supposedly Antonora did, your soul immediately descends into hell and a demon occupies your body for the remainder of your life. So I thought that was very interesting. Um, but shall we talk a little bit of Quidditch before before we go? Um, Ravenclaw verse, um, versus versus uh, I was going to say Slytherin, but excuse me, Ravenclaw versus Gryffindor. Yeah, sure, I sure. mean we got to talk about Cho Chang. Yes, yeah, and Cedric Diggory comes up to him and says, you know, good luck. And I thought that was interesting too. But yeah, Cho definitely more interesting. So yeah. What did y'all What did y'all think about this match and what led up to it? And I like that you mentioned the point that uh, apparently there's some ribbing going on amongst the professors between Snape and McGonagall, and that adds to it. And then after the game is won, if anything could make it better, it was the fact that the Slytherin were in trouble right in front of Harry, and he's been there before losing 50 points. So I thought that was a funny parallel. Um, so, yeah, what did y'all think? And Cho has a new style of play as a seeker. She marks him rather than looking for the truth or looking for the, the uh, snitch herself. And I wondered what y'all thought that meant. Hmm. Yeah, I, I don't, I'm not sure what to make of Cho's strategy, but I personally love every time we get a little bit of Lee Jordan Yes, um, he is great. <laughs> and McGonagall, Jordan, please, are you being paid by them? <laughs> I mean, and and that's the thing. Like, I, I, I want to think that Minerva McGonagall is like the paragon of of teaching, but she's also just so real. Like, she wants. She probably is saying inside all of the things that Lee Jordan is saying, but I don't know. I don't know if any of you have ever had a student where like they make a joke it's totally inappropriate if you want a teacher you would totally laugh but like they can't be saying that out loud like on school property kind of thing um and i i just i find that funny i i know that that's not really answering any of your questions um but i think the thing that struck me the most about the match was how like it was so like such an easy slam dunk win right like yeah uh, like it wasn't it wasn't this grave challenge like his match against Hufflepuff where it was pouring rain and there were dementors everywhere it was um you know it was it wasn't like that at least I don't remember the weather being so so terrible but um you know it was it was a relatively easy win, um, and I, I think that that means that it to me it's like it's a precursor to something else bad, you know. Um, it's like it's like setting the character up for like false sense of comfort when everything is going easy, you know. Like 
I don't, I don't know. I could be no, wrong. No, that, make, that makes perfect sense. It's like the fight in the movie with the much easier front guy that leads to the defeat at the hands of yeah. the far superior opponent. Like what happens in Rocky Three, when Rocky won't fight yeah. the real the real champ, the real champ uh, who's going to kill him. Um, but yeah, so, okay, okay, that's interesting to me. Um, uh, also because, um, well, what is it about, what is it about Ravenclaw that makes them such an easy opponent? What, what, what they're supposed to be known for is their quick and intelligent strategic thinking, but it looks like they're almost incapable of scoring at first. They're down by 80 points. And then their seeker uh, just marks and tries to block uh, Harry's thinking. So that made me, or seeking, that made me think two things about the situation. A, to what extent is this a representation of, say, a coy interaction or conversation between a boy and girl, where the boy tries to make some point and she sort of blocks him in order to frustrate him to get an emotional reaction out of him in sort of a uh, teasing relationship way? And we're seeing this sort of relationship bud or budget or virgin in this book, right? Like uh, all the girls kiss Harry after the after the Quidditch game, and um, of course Percy has a girlfriend, Penelope Clearwater now, and that's interesting because Penelope, you know, Odysseus's wife, and Percy is short for Perseus, um, or that's where the name originally comes from, the Greek hero who conquers Medusa, son of Danaea. <laughs> but um, but also of course Hermione and Ron are having this budding relationship. Um, but I also wonder. Oh, uh, what would what would it mean that a seeker does not seek herself, but rather attempts to keep another seeker from catching the snitch, even though her her chasers are doing worse? It's as if they're just trying to forestall the inevitable. Well, I I think I mean I didn't read it as like a a gendered thing, though obviously when you put it that way, it does sort of look kind of like hard to get versus, you know, trying to pick someone up. Like, <laughs> it does kind of look like that, like the the, the aggression versus the deflection. Yeah. But uh, um, I sort of read it, now that I went back and looked at it as you were talking and was listening, what if that's what the consequence is of, um, being smart without, or like being clever without being active, right? Mm. Um, like that's the, that's the, the two kind of qualities of Gryffindor and Ravenclaw. And Hermione is sort of like the perfect Gryffindor, right? Like she's super clever and insightful, but she's actually, she like acts on her intelligence. She embodies She doesn't, she, yeah, she doesn't hoard it. Um, unless she's trying to teach them a lesson about doing their homework, she doesn't, and and or she's trying to be mean, like when she says, "You don't know what's wrong with Lupin, isn't it obvious?" Like, um, <laughs> so so she does, I guess, occasionally hoard it, but maybe it's with an intent to get them to figure it out. But um, it's like what a skeptic does when somebody is trying to seek or grasp at or articulate something is to constantly knock down other people's ideas because they, well, you know, you find a hole or you find a way in which the wording was wrong or you find something wrong as opposed to making something new. Right. Um, it's like the difference, I guess, between like an artist and a critic. Yes. Um, critics know all of the theory. They know all of the history and every, you know, it's e almost easier to be a critic in some scenarios, but, um, uh, there's like a liberty in being a maker or a doer that also implies that you make mistakes, that you fail, that you fall and be injured and all of that. That you but, can only win if you do that. Yeah, but like, but but if if all she's doing is marking Harry and he has a firebolt and she's on a clean sweep 260 or whatever. Uh -huh. So let's say she watches him. Like, what's she going to do? Get between him and, a, and the snitch? Play defense? Um, that's her best option. She, if, if, if he zooms past her, she's never going to catch up. And like, uh, I think that's, you know, so back to the question of, is it fair that they have a fireball? Well, um, 
I mean, in that sense, if that's your strategy and that's generally what a seeker is supposed to do, they're not supposed to play defense. They're supposed to both be on offense. Um, and maybe it's a strategic way to keep him from uh, uh, finding the snitch because she's so pretty and she thinks that maybe he's going to be distracted. That's the only thing that I could think of, aside from the metaphor of maybe pursuing knowledge at the expense of truth um, or facts or um, the ability, you know, pursuing a, a role as a skeptic or a critic at the expense of actually trying to conjure or create something. Yeah, or um, even falsifying the process by which you you come to truth. Because I think I think you're right that what what the Ravenclaw team does here in potentially a more speculative and less embodied form, maybe a more sluggish form is what they do is try and constrain the game. That's what the seeker is doing. Like a, like a conversation between somebody who's seeking truth, but somebody who with someone who just wants to criticize or argue that um, Harry tries to seek the truth, tries to probe, just gets, just gets blocked, tries to seek the truth, gets insulted by a bleed, by a beater tries to seek the truth, gets blocked again. And so eventually he has to extricate himself from his relationship with this other seeker, right? He has to dive and then jump back up. And so it is interesting to what extent these Ravenclaws also epitomize these negative intellectual tendencies of, of criticizing rather than pursuing truth and of, in fact, getting in the way of attempting to, uh, to pursue truth and also not being able to embody uh, the pursuit of truth. Um, Wes, what did you think about that? I just think it's funny how, uh, yeah, I agree that the main interest in the scene seems to be Lee Jordan's commentary and McGonagall's attempts to get him back on track, <laughs> that that sort of like parallels, you know, what's going on with Harry and Cho, like trying to get his attention off of her and onto the snitch. And she like won't let him do that because she isn't really trying to get this snitch. She's trying to keep him from getting it. It's it's cool how that sort of like dynamic is is very playful and um, is being explored there. Uh, I thought it was also real interesting that that that's sort of what's going on with Sir Cadigan as well, right? He's kind of this weird little character who keeps popping up and being annoying. Um, and here he is like letting Sirius Black into the tower just because he's got a piece of paper he's clearly taken from one of the students and, and knows the passwords that way, right? So Cadigan is like making himself out to be this brave knight and yet lets Black in where the, um, the fat lady was super brave and stood up to Black, right? It's, it's, it's like, again, you sort of miss the, the forest for the trees or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he reminds me a bit of both Lockhart and and also Dobby and also a, from Star Wars, Jar Jar Binks. He's sort of a super annoying yeah. character, right? And he talks so much and he seems to be so clearly uh, puff and pomp and no bite. And he does show himself to be a, an utter fool, right? He, he just does the job as it is written rather than understanding the spirit of the job. And so he goes against the very theme of the book. If the theme of the book is the production of the Patronus, which is the defined sense of self as an individual. Um, he's, he's just a parody of an individual. He's a parody of that which is defensive. He's like a representative of an ideology, something that puffs you up, but gives you no real strength. Um, and thus he's a poor gatekeeper between you and that which could mm -hmm. harm you. Is what I thought of him. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's more. There's more that could be said. I mean, we do get Neville, uh, Neville Longbottom here at the very end, trembling from head to foot, uh -huh. toes. So, oh, okay, my cats. They're ready. They're ready for bed. I think. I think this is a good place to stop for now, though. All right. Yeah, I've, I've got to get going. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, thank you for joining me on my birthday, y'all. This has been a wonderful conversation as usual. And um, happy well, birthday, Alex. Thank you. All right. Well, I'll be sending you all an owl soon. And I look forward to doing this again soon. Happy yeah, reading. Yeah, we'll talk to you soon. Oh, yeah. And how about the next? Oh. The next. Um, yeah. Let's do a. Uh,
How about 14 and 15? It looks like that's a solid 50 pages or so, uh, almost 50 pages. And yeah. we get to see the Quidditch yeah. final, which maybe we'll see Wood, who seems to be coming increasingly, um, um, uh, what is it, stressed about the, the, the fact that he might not win. He's becoming obsessive about winning. It's interesting to see how that's motivating his reasoning, too. He also looks paler when he hears McGonagall is going to strip down the fireball and goes to talk to her and hears that his priorities are not straight. We really do get a lot of moralizing, I mean, I think good and effective moralizing by McGonagall in this uh, book. She's, she's a welcome presence, I would say. Oh, yeah. All right. All right. Well, Have a you. great rest of the evening, fellas. I'll talk to you soon. Talk All to you. right. Good night. Good night. Good night. The podcast you just heard was published with Anchor. Got something you want to say to the creator of this show? Send them a voice message using the Anchor app, free for iOS and Android.